Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. Thank you for making this a priority and setting aside time to sing songs of worship and to learn from God's Word. Uh, Let's begin our time with this call to worship from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing.
Let me invite you to pause the video now, take the order of worship that was emailed out to you, read through Psalm 92, and then as an individual or as a family, consider the questions that we've sent to you uh, that go along with Psalm 92. After you've done that, uh, we invite you to spend some time in prayer. You've been given some prayer points in the order of worship as well. And then maybe this would be a good time as well to take care of your regular giving, uh, knowing that that mission and ministry here at Redeemer and around the world is not ceasing to take place just because of the interruption we've experienced uh, through this very unusual time uh, in our country and around the world. of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. I hold my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead oh the night has been won and I shall overcome yet not I but through Christ in me Love. 
Let's pray together. Father, we ask that by your spirit you would work during this time as we sit in our homes, as maybe uh, some are gathered with a few friends or family members. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would actively work through the power of your word, that you would shape us and form us, that you would convict us and comfort us, that even though we are not gathered together as a church family, uh, we pray that uh, your work would continue in us through the power of your perfect word this morning. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. As we all continue to walk through this very unusual time, I've found it fascinating and, and not at all surprising that everywhere I turn, I'm encountering stories and conversations about hope. In fact, just yesterday, a news story posted on Facebook caught my attention. It was posted by the local television channel Care 11, and it was the following three words that, that jumped off the screen. Here they were, neighborhood hope dealer. Uh, this particular story was about a reporter named Adrian Broadus who, who put out a call on social media for people to submit videos or to post on their wall a three-word story, and it was in response to this question. How will we use our words in the coming days and weeks to deliver hope? How will we use our words in the coming days and weeks to deliver hope? Here were just some of the responses. Hang in there. Music is key. Just be kind. You are special. Enjoy family time. And my personal favorite, eat ice cream. Friends, there's a good reminder for us in this news story. As believers in the Lord Jesus, we, we have now been commissioned by him to be his witnesses. 
So we do absolutely believe that words are used to communicate hope. The gospel message is good news. It's an announcement. It's something to be spoken and declared. This is what we've seen and been reminded of all throughout the book of Acts, and it's what we'll be reminded of again this morning. Last week, we began looking at Paul's speech to King Agrippa and how the obvious theme he established immediately was this theme of hope. So last week, our time was focused on the search for hope. This week, we'll talk about finding hope. I want you to see three truths about real and lasting hope, or to put it more succinctly, let's call it gospel hope. And all three of these truths are laid out clearly in Paul's speech before King Agrippa. Here's truth number one. Gospel hope is given by God. Gospel hope is given by God. Hopefully you have your Bible opened or you have it up on some device. Look at the text with me, beginning in verse 12. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus, Paul is speaking, with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Remember why Paul was traveling to Damascus in the first place. He had been given permission by the religious authorities to seek out true believers in Jesus and persecute them. As he said back in verse 9, his aim was to oppose the name of Jesus. And then in verse 11, the NIV actually translates Paul's words this way. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. Friends, here's what I want you to see. Paul wasn't someone who was carefully considering the claims of Christ and weighing the pros and cons of embracing the gospel. He wasn't traveling to Damascus in hopes of finding answers to his deepest spiritual questions. He wasn't looking for Jesus. No, he was an enemy of Jesus. But what happened? As Paul was living under the delusion that he could please God by keeping the law and persecuting those who he perceived were dangerous by an act of sheer grace and without Paul's permission, God interrupted his life. We could say that it was on the Damascus road that Paul found hope. But friends, it would be far more accurate, wouldn't it, to say that on the Damascus road, hope found Paul. This was entirely the work of God. And in fact, look back at verse 14 again. And when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. As Paul is sharing with King Agrippa the true story of his radical conversion, he recounts hearing the voice of Jesus, and Jesus said this, It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, what does this mean? Well, a a goad was a sharp-pointed stick that was used to move animals in a particular direction. So if you owned a, a farm with large animals on it, you would use a goad to prod the animals, trying to move them where you actually wanted them to go. You can picture this, can't you? But what does Jesus say as Paul lays crumpled in a heap on the ground? Well, he talks about the difficulty of kicking against the goads. 
Imagine an animal being prodded with a sharp instrument, and at the very same time, the, the animal kicks back into it. This would be a pointless and painful act. Brothers and sisters, when God knocked Paul down on the Damascus road, Paul was being sovereignly redirected. And it would have been painful and pointless for Paul to do anything other than submit to the prodding of Almighty God. The true and lasting hope that Paul was now boldly declaring before King Agrippa was not something he discovered on his own, but it was given to him by a merciful and loving God. I want you to see something more. Not only was Paul's ultimate hope given by God, but his hope was entirely based on what Christ had done for him, not what he could do for himself. Paul's hope was given by God, and it was focused on Jesus. That's our second point. Gospel hope is focused on Jesus. We see this in verses 15 through 18. Look at the text again. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now again, there's, there's a lot here that we don't have time to cover this morning. But let me summarize what's transpiring in verses 15 through 18. Paul is recounting to King Agrippa a conversation that he had with the risen Lord Jesus, where Jesus explained to Paul how he had been chosen to be a witness for Jesus and a mouthpiece for for the gospel to both Jews and Gentiles. But friends, pay careful attention to the language of verse 18. Look at it again. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. The result of this miraculous encounter with Jesus was a new man with a new mission. And this was his new mission. It was to to announce that any person anywhere could find eternal hope in and through the person and work of Jesus. The language used here is the language of conversion. This is what it means to be converted to Christ. A sinner turns from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, receiving forgiveness of sins and being joined to all those who are sanctified in Christ. You see, a saving encounter with Jesus, it gives someone a new life and a new mission. And this isn't just true for the Apostle Paul but it's true for everyone who turns to Christ in faith. In Christ, all who believe possess a a true and lasting hope, a hope that is rooted and grounded in Christ alone. In fact, listen to what Paul writes to the Colossians. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. These two verses 
in some way, summarize all that we've talked about so far. Delivered, transferred, redeemed, and forgiven. These are all works of the triune God. Salvation is accomplished entirely by God, and it's all of grace. This is how Paul could stand in the midst of an earthly kingdom and in front of an earthly king and could pledge his allegiance and affection to another king as a member of another and far greater kingdom. Gospel hope. Gospel hope transcends circumstances and bolsters believers even in the most difficult and uncertain times. We think not only about Paul in this setting, but we think about what all of us are facing now. I would describe what we're facing now as uncertain, difficult. But you see, in Christ, we possess a a hope that transcends circumstances and it bolsters us. It doesn't shake us. You say, well, I need to be reminded of this right now. Well, let me remind you by offering you Paul's words to the Romans. It's a glorious text of Scripture from Romans chapter 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, or pandemic, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long, we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, for I am sure, I am sure That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, friend, let that fill your heart with hope. Paul's hope was given by God. It was focused entirely on Christ. And finally, our our third point, gospel hope is displayed through obedience. It's displayed through obedience. Again, look at the text with me, verse 19. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Brothers and sisters, how do you know? How do you know someone has been rescued from their sin and made new in Jesus? Well, a new heart gives way to a new life. Belief produces behavior. We know that Paul believes in Jesus because he obeys Jesus. He's not simply declaring Christ to be the king, but he is submitting to the rule of Christ as his king. Notice verse 21. What? What made certain Jews so angry with Paul was was not simply that he embraced the gospel personally, but it's that he was now living missionally. 
He was doing something with this faith. He was declaring the message. He was telling people that they needed to do what he did. Repent and turn to God. Of course, he wasn't doing this to cause trouble per se. He was doing this out of love for Christ and love for people. For Paul, for Paul to have experienced the saving grace of God in Jesus and then to keep that good news to himself, well, this would have been a profoundly selfish and unloving thing to do. So wherever God led Paul to a synagogue, to the home of Someone who opened it up to be hospitable to him. In the presence of King Agrippa, it didn't matter where he was. He was going to do what he believed was was the most loving thing he could possibly do. And that is to declare the message of hope. To talk openly about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And to call people to repentance and faith in Christ. We could say it this way, Paul does what every child of God is commanded to do. He becomes a witness for Jesus by speaking the gospel to those who are without hope. Let me briefly point out now the response of both Festus and Agrippa before we close this morning. First, the response of Festus. Look at verse 24. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. Friends, Festus rejects the hope of the gospel and declares that Paul is crazy. This is a very sad scene, isn't it? Festus has been with Paul. He has heard Paul speak extensively. He has not only heard the gospel declared, but he has seen the resolute and unwavering hope of Paul in the face of violent opposition. And yet, this is his response. The response of Festus is to dismiss the message and denounce the messenger. But in so doing, He is denying himself any true and lasting hope. Look now at the response of Agrippa in verse 27. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, Whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Then the king rose, and the governor, and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. When they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Friends, Agrippa declares that Paul is innocent, but sadly, he as well rejects the hope of the gospel. Paul has boldly and clearly presented the gospel to Agrippa. He has shared his own personal testimony. He has offered Agrippa a riveting account of his his own transformation 
by the power of Christ. He's told him the story and given him the explanation. How how on earth did this religious terrorist become a humble servant? Well, the only explanation is an encounter with Christ. And yet Agrippa turns away without believing. Again, friends, this is a tragic account. But let me close with with two quick thoughts in summary. First, our text this morning, it, it reminds us that no one has or will ever be saved, be rescued from their sin, apart from the sovereign intervention and initiative of God. And realizing this, or being reminded of this, is not only cause for joyful worship, but it is cause for humble service. Understanding the sovereignty of God and salvation does not puff us up, but it brings us low in worship and service before God. This is why when we sing the song, O Great God, we begin by praising God for His overcoming grace, And then we end by singing this. Help me now to live a life that's dependent on your grace. Keep my heart and guard my soul from the evils that I face. You are worthy to be praised with my every thought and deed. O great God of highest heaven, glorify your name through me. The only appropriate response to the saving grace of God is to offer him everything. Here is the second and final thought I have for you. Our text this morning reminds us that our job, our job, brothers and sisters, is to boldly, clearly, and lovingly present the gospel to everyone. We ought to seek to appropriately persuade sinners to repent and believe. But friends, that is all we can do. We cannot transform their heart. We cannot make them believe. This is the work of God. And this is the mystery of his sovereignty. Many will many will hear the good news of Jesus, but they will walk away. And while this should always grieve us, should deeply grieve us, it should never shake the foundations of our faith or cause us to wonder what we might have done differently to close the deal or to question God's love for sinners. No, no, brothers and sisters, let God be God passionately preach Christ, pray like crazy, and then lay your head on the soft pillow of the sovereignty of God. I started this message by referencing a news story that asked people for a three-word message of encouragement and hope. As we close, I want to invite you to do this as well. In light of our text this morning and the songs we've sung, as an individual or as a family, spend some time, spend some time coming up with three-word messages of encouragement and hope. And then I would invite you and I would ask you to consider during this strange and difficult time, consider sharing those brief messages with someone who needs to hear them. It could be a Christian that's in need of encouragement. It could be an unbelieving friend or coworker or neighbor that, that needs to hear this message. But would you consider doing that? 
if we gave the Apostle Paul this assignment, here are a few he might offer us. And with these, I'll close. So imagine that I'm interviewing the Apostle Paul and I ask him, Paul, give us a message of hope in three words. Perhaps he would offer us some of these. Repent and believe. Trust in Jesus. Go and tell. Christ saves sinners. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that the work of the word by the power of the Spirit is not bound to a particular place. So even though we are scattered about as a faith family, we know that this in no way hinders the work of the Spirit and the power of the word. Would you use the word of God O Holy Spirit, to convict us, to comfort us, to change us, to motivate us, to worship and to serve as your witnesses. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, brothers and sisters, for taking the time to watch this video. We hope that it's been a blessing and an encouragement to you. Before I offer you a blessing, let me, again, just give you a couple of reminders. Uh, This is a time when we need to be praying for each other. We need to be seeking to encourage each other. So figure out ways to do that. Uh, Leverage technology, a simple text, a phone call, uh, a FaceTime call, Zoom meetings for community groups. There are a number of ways that we can still stay in touch with each other. And so we encourage you uh, to take advantage of, of, all of those, all of those opportunities. As well, if you're in need, if, uh, if this has brought a hardship upon you, please do not hesitate to reach out. We want to serve you. We want to be a blessing to you. We want to assist you in any way that we can. Now let me offer you a blessing as we close uh, this video. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You are sent, though again it's in a very different way during this uh, very strange time. Go and make disciples.